It's a new day, new morning. It's a little cooler out, thankfully. Yesterday was like 115 in here. Today, with Riley, and we're gonna be making up some handles for some hammers we made yesterday. What kind of wood are we working with? Hickory. Oh, hickory. Only one. So you basically, are you cutting it lengthways this way to get our finished length? Yeah, so we'll cut it 18 inches length. Okay. And then we'll uh, set the saw up to rip, and then we'll rip them at uh, inch and a half wide. And rip them is basically gonna go this way. Yep. Okay. Yeah, not in the usable blanks. Sweet. That's well, kind of cool. Since one, my first one I made, I was trying to get used to the power hammer and I sunk the drift way down in there so my hole is massive. So if you were to go buy an off the shelf handle, it probably wouldn't fit in there. So <laughs> since we can hand make our handles, be able to fit it in there just for that eye. Size try to like, like this size measuring at one and three eighths. And so if I do an inch and a half handle, it'll fit. Because you're gonna drive wedges in and it's gonna swell a little bit, right? Yeah, but you just want, you want a little bit of a bell underneath the hammer, like a little swell. Okay. So the hammer won't slide um, down the handle. Yeah. And so you want it just wider than the eye is. So this meant, oh, inch and a half, my bad, yeah. Yeah. So if we're inch and three eighths and we cut an inch and a half handle, yep. we'll have enough room for swell on either side. Yep. I was having a little brain fart. It's, it's really not that much difference. That one just looks way bigger, you know? Yeah. Like it's only a 16th bigger though. Hmm. For that wedge, it doesn't go a lot. It's a pretty shallow taper. <laughs> yeah. So we'll cut three with an inch and a half. Cool. Wood is definitely not my forte either, so. I'm learning here from Riley. <laughs> so like the one thing about the table saw or like wood saws is they have the teeth have alternate. They go one side to the other. So they they give what's called kerf to the blade. So the blade has relief. It's, so it's not binding on. Mm -hmm. So the teeth are the only things in contact. So you want to make sure you measure the right tooth. Because if you measure a tooth that goes that way. You're going to be uh You're going to be almost an eighth of an inch sh shy. Yep. You got to make sure you're right. Measure off a tooth that's to the inside. Sure. But I'm there. Wait. Now, will you just basically go ahead, if you're in your everyday work, would you just go ahead and slab all these out? I will. And just cut just all the handles there. while you got it yeah, going. But also, each board, you know, you're cutting it from a tree. So you just got a slab of this, like, round pieces. So it's pretty, pretty off, like, often the piece or two on the edge isn't great. So that one, the grain's going almost, you know, horizontal with it, and it should be going vertical with it. So we, that first handle is just going to be kind of a, a sacrificial piece to get it out of the way. Yeah, because of the grain. And then we start getting into the diagonal grains. But those are kind of B, B grade handles. And then, like you can tell, we got one or two in the middle that are A grade handles. Like, they're tight, straight grain. We want the A grade on mine. <laughs> Where do you usually get all this wood from? So it's a little bit of a, a like it's hard to find wood because no one ever really has. Like we are a small community that needs thick hickory. It's good, straight grain. But if you can find a floor manufacturer near you or a, a, a hardwood floor store, floor makers don't want straight grain, nice hickory. Oh. It doesn't have any character. Yeah, they want. 
they want weird figured out hickory that we don't want. Yeah. And so every one of those hardwood floors manufacturers usually have a pile of hickory boards that are straight grain just sitting to just the side to that nobody ready. wants. Yeah. And so if I go in and buy them up from He's been doing a little bit of like, traditionally we all wanted the grain to run with our hammer. But now, like something I've been thinking about a lot now that it's like doing a lot of things with bows is the bow makers never make their bows like that. Their bows are always made with the grain going with the, like 90 degrees to the flex. Perpendicular? Yeah, perpendicular to the flex, where we make it go in line with our flex. Yeah, because we're swinging. Yeah, so, but I wonder if that's why we snap them sometimes, because the wood can't flex that way. But if we do them the other way, they can get some flex out of it. Have you tried it yet? I've tried a few of them, and mine haven't broken. Yeah. And they ran pretty well, but, when you sell somebody a hammer, they're expecting to get an, if they pay a good amount for a hammer, they're expecting to get a handle with nice straight grain running with the hammer, because that's the normal. But I do think we could uh, question it a little bit more and try it, like play with it. Yeah. Because we wouldn't be throwing away as many handles, and you never know, like it might be better. We it might be loose. taking more shock out of our elbows and our shoulders. Trial and error, basically. Yeah, if you want to buy a hammer from Riley, you can follow him on Instagram, at KirkpatrickForge. Or you can go to his website at www.patrickforge.com and uh, he'll basically post on his Instagram or Facebook saying these hammers are available, they'll go on the website at this time, get them while they last, and they usually sell like hotcakes, so if you want one, you gotta be lickety split with it. So we pick out a handle, you wanna pick out a good handle, you wanna try to, for, you know, the, like what we just talked, people want straight grain. So we choose a handle with the grain running with the hammer. And we want a handle that the grain, we can get our, like, we have the most lines, I guess, grains that are going tip to tip. That is not a lot of run out, what it's called. So you have like the grains are going like this, and it's called run out, where it's running out of the handle. That's probably where you're gonna break it. It's kind of a weak point. Yeah. But if you have, no matter which way the grain's running, but if you have it, end to end like this where it's in the whole length of the handle it's a stronger handle and it's less of a failure point and so I'll just throw my hammer up there I'll give myself about three sixteenths or so at the top of a bit and I'll go ahead and draw my line where my hammer ends and that's going to kind of be where it bells out right yep this is where it's just a reference point when I'm on the grinder so I, I'll make a line all the way around all four sides so now I have this reference point of where I need to put my swell at on my hammer cool and i just always kind of just take a, a look pretty much of about how much need will need to be moved off of each side so i know this way i'm gonna have to take like about oh, yeah, a quarter of an inch off of each one of them and if i turn it this way and put it up there well i can see i don't need to go much so i just know right away when i'm on the grinder be careful going this way get after a little bit going this way yep and i always do just from I just have a forging mind, I feel like, and that's the way I try to think, is that I always go to square, then I take the edges, and then I ramp. And that's yep. the best way to make something even. Yep, that's the way I've done handles as well, with a rasp or whatever. Just like forging, we're uneven, so I try to grind both ways. Try now, you can take a check. You can see, all right, I'm inside the eye. Maybe a little bit more. So I know I'm getting close, so I just try looking down it and make sure that I've been working evenly. And if it's still gonna be hard for you, you can always draw a center line both ways. Yep. And that'll let you know where you originally were. Cause it's easy to get off pretty, pretty quickly. Easy. And then all of a sudden the hammer struck is, you know? Yep. Like, I used to not be as good at grinding. And so I'd always think that a lot of my hammers were crooked. I, I think it was just my handles were crooked. Yeah. All right, now I'm inside the eye. And so like, I just want to take a look at my corners 
And I know I can't just go straight against them. They'd be too round. I want more of an oval, so I want to be a little bit more of an angle. Okay. So I don't want to be like this, right with the corner. I want to be a little bit more off of it. So I'm not making it short. Now I just try to make sure these are the same widths. If those are the same width, they're probably the same depth. Yeah. Just like forging the faces on our hammers. Yep. And then I take those little lines, run them in a bit. Yep. Start making a, a oval. And then just from trial and error, I always know this spot right here gets in the way of the cheeks. So I just start. I just take those a little bit more. I'm rounding while I'm doing it. So I fit, I want, I want to fit inside the bottom of the eye there. So I need to be a little bit skinnier and you can look down it. And you see, I just need to skinny up a little bit. Yep. This way, yeah. Uh, and it's hard to see your shape from here. But if you come from here, you can really see where you're off. It's kind of the same as like grinding up a fuller, you know, when you're trying to tune your fuller. Yeah, everybody like, they think running a grinder is easy. Yeah, it's hard. It's really, really hard. You can't trust that this is flat or anything. No, like, they usually are. They're, usually, they're always off. This is not a precision tool. <laughs> Kind of give that a little chamfer. Now we're getting close. We're fitting in there. So right. the way I was taught to fit a handle is you want it to go in there as hard as possible. You want it to not need a lot of wedging. If you need a lot of wedging, it means you didn't fit your handle up right. And so I try to fit the way Andy Reedersmith taught me is I try to fit the top of my handle to the bottom of the, like, my opening. And once I can go in there, I know that my hammer has an hourglass eye. And so I just don't touch this anymore and I hourglass the handle behind it. Oh yeah, in so right that in means here. I'll have to force that big part through the hourglass. But once it goes through, you'll feel it's like rough, rough, rough. You feel like you're gonna break the handle and then it goes. Yep. And so how Andy does it, Andy won't wedge them. He'll just stick them in a bucket of water after that and let it swell well. up. And I have a couple of his hammers that have no wedges in them. Wow. And you can hear the noise. It gets like higher pitch as you get closer to the edge. And then when you go over the edge, uh, that pitch goes away. So I'm not trying, I can't see under the wheel. So I'm just listening for the pitch. That's kind of the same as like when you're driving nails and feet. Like you could be driving and not even like see it, but you can hear and feel it in your hammer, like just a different pitch and you can know whether it's coming in, going in or coming out. So it looks like I got a pretty good hourglass. I hogged these corners off. Do that so then I can hit it. I don't mess up the handle. The one thing it's like if you drive in the air, which is a, a good idea, right? Yeah. It lets that handle drive through there. But something you got to think about when you have offset hammers is that it's going to follow momentum. So if you have a heavy five, it's going to that five side is going to work down. You can see it where the round side's riding up. So you just gotta come back and 
hit it. If you already got something that's nice and finished and you don't want to scratch it, I just keep a little sacrificial, sacrificial piece of wood so I don't mess anything up. Now, so we haven't ground on these at all yet. Are you uh, gonna be taking that handle out again? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, a couple times. So I got that handle in there. And you can see it was like, it was pretty hard to get in. Yeah, oh yeah. And now that I'm in and my, the wood's past the top, I'll just go ahead and mark myself a bottom to where I know where I can grind up to with that swell. And it'll be even. And I just let the pencil be the measuring tool. You're leaving yourself some some room. Yep. Because that hand that hammer is gonna get beat up. And so you I try to I try to not to go all the way right away when I'm handling a hammer. So I don't put a metal wedge or anything in because I want to leave somewhere for it to go when that hammer starts getting loose later in its life. The guy can drive a metal wedge in. Well, and if I put the swell all the way to the bot right here, it looks really nice and looks really, really finished and fit, but then the guy never has any room for later down the road when he's working to keep tightening up his hammer as it's getting beat up. I have that issue with two of my hammers right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll get it where I got that marked. And generally, uh, the eye is not perfect, right? It's a, it's, everything was handmade. The drift was handmade. This is handmade. And so I mark the handle in direction with the hammer. And I always just mark pointing towards the flat side. And so then I know which way this handle was in here yep. because right now it's sitting on the hammer square. And so I want it to just be square again. And now is a good time to just look down your handle and see if it's in there a little crooked compared to the hammer. And you, so you can grind it straight. And this one's pretty good. Lots of practice and lots of doing it yeah. to get sure. at that point. And that's, it, I always beat them up trying to get them out. So after I put the arrow mark on them. Yeah, this is something I'm curious about. I come up and I just put a cut in it. So the cut won't go away when I burn the handle yeah. or anything else. It'll you be there for that time. That's the way it's gotta go. Yeah, it's got the square faces. Yeah. From here. Oh yeah, because it's a, yeah. Yeah, that, that cheek's nice too. Blind squirrel finds an acorn every now and again. So you butted it up there. Yep. And you got your mark. There. And you just went. Now, I don't know if you knew this about, like, so did you match up? Oh, you did. That's pretty good. Like in general, like we all lift. Oh yeah, it always. So he's always, I always just like exaggerate and pull. It's kind of something I've learned just by doing that is. You always just go always just screwing right. it up. Yeah. So, so now then I go to the grinder and I start taking away. Yeah, and you get a look from the bottom too. Even like just set it like that. Oh yeah, that's right. And you can really see how much has got to go. So a guy could almost like put train and wheels, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I did that for a while. So we'll get her square here. I'm just gonna leave myself a little bit so I don't go. Yep. You always end up taking more than you think you need to. Yeah. In gen it, it seems like you're like, okay, I'm there. And you go to fit it up, like, all right, eighth of an inch more all the way around <laughs> and I'll be there. <laughs> And this way we want to go turn the hammer this way yeah oh yeah huh. I feel like that that's how I kind of look at it hard to write on though huh? yeah That's how you learn by doing it. Exactly. For me, I'm a guy. I have a hard time reading something in a book and figuring out how to do it. Oh yeah, I can't. But if I'm shown how to do it, yep. and do the steps, I can get it figured out. All right, so let's start.
what do we gotta do uh, next here? All right, we got the eye fit up. So now we're gonna fit up back into the handle, the working part, part that matters a little bit. Something I, I just try to keep in mind is I want the handle strong. I don't want it to break, but I want it a little bit weaker at the neck than it is at the base. Uh, two things for that is that it gets a little bit of vibration out of the hammer. It lets the vibration happen where it's the weakest, you know, where it's the thinnest. Oh, so it's not vibrating you here. Yep, yeah. If you have this straight stick, there. man, you hit something, you get all the Feel vibration it. right into your hand. But if you have a little bit of a vibration dampener, a little bit of a break, some spring happens there, it can break there, but handles are cheap, elbows are not. Yeah. <laughs> and it also makes the bottom of the handle bigger when you taper that a little bit all the way down. So as you're swinging harder and harder, you don't have to keep gripping the hammer harder and harder. Yeah. You can loosen up a little bit and just let that thing fall to the end of the hammer and that little bit of a swell catches your hand and you can just stay there. Yep. Nice. So I go ahead and it's always easier to grind things that are skinnier. So I'll go ahead and grind these sides first. So that'll bring it down size and then these will be easier to grind. So to be nice to the machine. With all the hammers that you make, do you go through the process of fitting up your handle and everything first and then go to grinding on your I hammer? I do, I do, and that's like two reasons. It's like part of it started as I wasn't as good at forging hammers and stuff, and so I would put the handle on there so then I could make sure the handle was straight or kind of around the hammer. Yeah. Because I didn't really want to grind the hammer crooked. I wanted the hammer nice and straight as it could be, and so then I'd kind of adjust the handle to be. I don't have that problem as much anymore. But now more I do it because the belt is fresh on the wood. Yeah. And so it cuts really nice. Yeah. And then the belt's still sharp by the time I get done with the handle. And I go ahead and use that same belt on my, my hammer. Yeah. And so then it gets through the hammer pretty quick. Nice. Makes sense. It's always work even, good both ways. So you want to keep it square the whole time you're working on it, even though it's going to end up roundish. I always like the smell of wood, you know, being ground on or even cut like a paint off. Yeah, hickory has like almost that like cigar yeah. smell to it. It's really good. So I just want to make sure I'm up to my mark on both sides and then I look like I'm grinding even. Where you, I just try to get keep the same, same speed and speed per se. This is in the same amount of passes each direction and that'll hopefully keep things straight. Now you really don't want to push too hard because the, metal, the wood will always have softer and harder spots, kind of. And so if you're really pushing hard, it'll eat into those soft spots and roll it, you'll feel it. But if you kind of just keep even pressure and let the belt eat, it doesn't, it doesn't go into those soft spots as bad. To get that taper I was talking about, I just apply more pressure as it's getting closer to the top. The handle shapes are like pretty dang personal. Yep. So it's one of the hard things like selling to the public is they're all going to have a different idea. But you also got to take into consideration some of these people have no idea. And so I try to give them what I think is a good handle and what I use, but it's also still big enough that they could whittle it into a different idea. I just try not to ever give a big old club. Yeah. Uh, I think there's like a lot of people screw up and they get a handle that's too skinny and it rolls in their hand a lot. Well, like, I, I think they can be pretty dang skinny this way. There's really strength in the handle doesn't really come from this too much. It comes from this. 
but I like to have a little bit of width going that way so it doesn't roll in my hand. Yep. It's all for the 36 grit. Now are you gonna go to a finer grit you said? Yep, I go to a 120 flex, J flex belt so it, it's not as stiff, it'll roll oh. and round so the edges won't dive in. And also I'll take a lot of these, there's like little lines in there. Yeah. It's not completely round. Yep. And so that J flex will take those little lines and then I'll hit it with a 60 grit detail sander and it'll kind of even soften everything up from there. Now, before you change out your belt, are you, since you have this 36 grit on here, are you gonna go with your hammer? Yep. And then, so you're not having to like change between belts. I want to switch belts and then this is left rough. So then when, while my hammer's tempering, I'm not just sitting around and doing, doing nothing. nothing. I can go and finish my handle. Yep. Makes sense. Well, now it's my turn to do mine. Get some shape in there. So now I think we're gonna do the last steps on the uh, the handle here. Yep. It's just a uh, J flex belt. You see how there is flexy. Yeah, I've never seen something like that. Now when you're working on one handle, will you have to clean it out with that rubber on like say this grit? Or are you just gonna no, do it until? I do the whole one. Yeah. And then I go. So I just go up and down, the normal, and then I go to the slack. And like, the longer you go, the flatter it can be. The more you go this way, the more it can get into little bumps. Yeah. So I just try to go really lengthwise. gets the uh, the black color to his handles this is how he does it right here Just love. Scotch bright. Okay. Scotch bright's out there. See the posture. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Do that, knock off all the, the loose crud. Then grab just something metal and round. Throw it in. You can see how shiny it gets it. Oh yeah. Compacts it all up. I guess something I've used before is uh, putting it in the vise and just grabbing a pair of tongs and you know. I just don't like putting uh, marks in it from the vise. Yeah, I can see that. And then, so when you do this, it kind of leaves a bunch of little lines though. But they aren't bad, they'll go away. But then I'll take the handle to my buffer. <clears throat> I just go to the same wheel and so when I was done buffing my hammer, I just let the compound kind of run out on it. It makes that handle nice and shiny looking. Oh yeah. And when they're shiny and they're smooth, they don't eat your hand up. Yep. So now that it's still warm, I dip it in some boiled linseed. And I just kind of let it soak all the way up and down it. And then I stand it up in the table. And let it dry. 
go. Nice. Well, now it's my turn to do mine. Now we're cooking with Crisco. tools and less knowledge yeah <laughs> it was a little cooler on the temp that day I remember but yeah well what I want to talk about is we're gonna be giving away this hammer that I made that Riley helped me make and showed me how to make it so we're gonna I'm gonna put a post on my Instagram page what I want you to do is like it tag two people and then subscribe to my YouTube channel and DM me a picture that you are subscribed to my YouTube channel. And once we get to 1,200 subscribers, one of you guys, whoever sends me the DM that you are subscribed and that you do the other two rules of liking the photo and tagging two people, you could win this hammer. Should be pretty sweet. I might try and use it before. It may have some dings in it by then. <laughs> we'll give it a, a go. little break-in marks. Yeah. Well, sweet. Get the demons out of it. Yeah, see if it needs any more tuning. <laughs> yeah, there yeah. you go. Cool, man. Thank you. Thank you. It's a good time. Till we meet again. <laughs>